Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm here with Jeff David of PDF Solutions, who's going to talk today about how machine learning applies to different back-end applications. So Jeff, one of the big problems in machine learning is that we've got all this data coming in, but there's so many different iterations of how people, what people are designing, how they're applying machine learning, how they're setting up their chips, that nothing's the same. How do you deal with that, and how does that affect all the data? You know, from a machine learning perspective, there's a lot of different use cases that, uh, that you can apply machine learning to on the back end. Uh, you know, for example, if you want to predict uh, RMA's uh, field returns, uh, you know, what we refer to as uh, early life failures, uh, you can do that uh, using data that you collect uh, on the back end and also on the front end as well if it's available. And using that data, you can predict uh, what RMAs are going to be coming in from the field. And uh, that gives you the opportunity to screen for those die before they actually go out to the field. So that's a huge amount of value that uh, we can realize for our Fabulous customers. And this is the classic bathtub curve, right? And you want to catch all the errors that you have as soon as you can in the front of that bathtub curve. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's not only, you know, the bathtub curve, uh, but you can also think about it as a trade off. Uh, between, you know, if you frame it out as uh, percent fallout and the percent of population predicted to be at risk, uh, you can generalize that out, uh, you know, not only apply it to uh, early life failures, but you can also uh, apply it to other applications like, um, you know, selective test. Uh, for example, if you want to predict uh, which uh, failures, uh, if a chip is going to fail or not at, at a given uh, final test, uh, insertion, uh, you can do that. For example, an expensive uh, example of that would be burn-in. If you can predict if a chip is going to fail at burn-in and not uh, apply that test to burn-in um, and still guarantee the same level of defective parts per million or billion, um, then you can save a lot of money on that test. So, uh, and, and basically the, the, the concept of how you apply machine learning uh, solutions to these various different uh, use cases, you know, at the core is fundamentally very, very similar. So let's dig into this a bit. Uh, sure. Jeff, what are we looking at here? Yeah, what, what I'm showing here is, uh, you know, a very generalized concept of the trade-off curve uh, that can be applied to different back-end applications. You know, again, uh, the, the specific use case may be different, but they can be kind of uh, thought of in, in, in the same manner. So what I'm showing here is, uh, is on the y-axis, uh, you would have a percent fallout, and on the x-axis, you would have percent of population predicted to be at risk. And what I'm showing here is different curves that a machine, uh, machine learning model uh, might generate for um, you know, the, these uh, different trade-offs. For example, uh, the orange curve might represent a weaker model compared to the blue curve that represents the uh, best model. And from an analytics perspective, each point on the curve can be represented by, you know, what uh, is called a confusion matrix. And I'm showing here examples of confusion matrix that would represent each point on the curve. And uh, what that shows is, is, uh, is a trade-off between false negatives and false positives, right? So false negatives uh, might be that uh, you, you predicted that um, you predicted that the test would pass, but it actually failed. And a false positive might be that uh, you predicted that it would fail, but it actually passed. So what we're showing here is this uh, this trade-off between these, um, you know, two two different uh, regimes of machine learning. And really, what you're trying to get to here is, is better models, right? So you don't necessarily need all the data, but you do need the relevant data. Yeah, exactly. So what would feed into these uh, these models? is um, upstream data that you collect before you make these predictions. So for example, in the uh, use case of smart test, uh, uh, where you're predicting whether or not a chip will fail at, at a given final test insertion, uh, what you're doing 
is uh, your, you might use uh, input data from upstream test insertions, for example, wafer sort or PCM, uh, or if you have the data available all the way upstream to the, uh, the fab itself. Jeff, you talk about a confusion matrix. What is that? Yeah, so what I'm showing here is uh, various uh, representations of confusion matrix for different points on the curve. So confusion matrix here, so on the, so if you take this one in the uh, the upper left, uh, framed out by, by the orange frame. So on the y-axis, you would have uh, the actual result of a, of a test insertion. And on the x-axis, what you have is uh, what the prediction actually was. So you can break it down into four different buckets. Uh, true positive, uh, true negative, false positive, and false negative. So what we would have up here, you might call a true negative, where if you represent a negative as a pass, right? So that means that the, the uh, chip actually passed that test, and we also predicted it to pass. So that's good. And down here on the bottom right, we have uh, that the chip at, would actually fail that test, and we predicted it, uh, it to fail. So that's good, too. So what you, where, so you want to live in this upper left box and this lower right box. Where you don't want to be is uh, in this upper right box and this lower left box. These represent uh, false positives and false negatives. So, you know, for this example data set um, um, that I'm showing, so let's say you have a population of a million chips and you have, uh, uh, you know, fa actual failures of 500 chips. How well does your model predict those failures and that can be represented in this confusion matrix right and what i'm showing here is that um well uh, for this orange model if you look at this point on the curve then uh this is what your your uh your false positives and false negatives are now a better model uh you would actually end up in this case you can see here that your false negatives are going to be less right um, so that's good. So if you compare uh, this orange confusion matrix where you have uh, uh, this false negative three set 365 and you compare it uh, to this confusion matrix, we have less false negatives, that's 215. So the, the blue uh, rendition is better. And But now you can think of for different uh, backend applications, it's going to determine where it is you live on this curve. So, for example, if you're uh, doing a selective uh, test where you want to predict whether or not you skip that test, you may want to live down here on this part of the curve, where you say, "Okay, um, I don't want to have, I don't want to miss any failures for that for that test." Um, but I'm, if if I predict that it fails, then I want to go ahead and send it through that test, where um, so basically, I would wait my confusion matrix and the model itself, the failure propensity, in a way that I minimize the amount, the amount of a false negatives. Again, where false negatives means that I, I predicted to, that it would pass, but it actually failed. So, but you know, now there's a cost for that um, in terms of the amount of uh, false positives that I get. But basically, what I'm saying is, for that application, this is where I want to live, um, and that's you know can be represented on this point down here, where I'm saying that okay, I, my tolerance for fallout is very very low, um, but uh, and, and I'm okay with and I'm okay with uh, sacrificing the amount of uh, false positive I have. So that means okay, in reality, I'm going to be sending roughly about 50 percent of my chips to that uh, expensive test and the other 50 percent I can pass with high confidence. Really what you're doing here is weighting the data right in terms of the value. Well I'm, I'm actually yeah um, so that the the data itself doesn't necessarily change but the failure propensity that um, I'm applying to that data I'm, a, I'm basically adjusting where it is in terms of the the prediction, the confidence I have in prediction for individual chips, uh, where where it is that I decide I want to live on that on that uh, propensity curve. 
So what does an early life failure really look like with all this data? Um, early life failure, as we mentioned, is uh, one use case, and you would want to live in this part of the curve. Now, you know, what I'm showing here, this is, you know, uh, maybe not the most realistic uh, early life failure case. Usually for early life failure, our customers want to do uh, outlier screening in, the, in a very low percentage value. They want to throw out a very low percentage of their good population in order to catch uh, chips that might fail out in the field. So your your curve, you would want to live in this part of the curve, right? Now, for a real early life failure situation, you, it, you want this to be even steeper. Um, and you know what we do for for early life failure uh, and other backend applications too is we have a number of different uh, types of um, outlier screening techniques that in the machine learning world can be thought of uh, of as uh, uh, anomaly detection, unsupervised learning, or in some situations, semi-supervised learning. And uh, we can also use those as engineered features for other models. So let me show you quickly, um, you know, a rendition of this uh, early life failure uh, where we basically screen for RMAs in, in the data set. So, uh, you know, obviously, so, so what we're showing here is that for uh, different individual parametric inputs, uh, which we've, uh, we, we've obfuscated here, we, we don't want to reveal what those test parameter names are. And you can focus in on a certain area of those parameters and look at uh, general generally what the, the variance is uh, for those parameters. And up here on the y-axis would be by wafer, by lot. And we also have you know an example of a few different of our um, outlier screening uh, techniques that operate on a univariate basis. And uh, so if you look at this area uh, for those uh, for these different uh, parametric inputs, you can look at what the distribution is over the population for, you know, the uh, again, what I'm showing here is three different examples of our, our frequency dispersion, spatial dispersion and gap detection. And uh, also, and this is the raw value of uh, this sample of uh, eight wafers that we have shown. If you have a cutoff here, how is this value rendered on the wafer? So it gives our uh, viewers a way to look at the uh, wafer data. What does the different colors mean? So red, yellow, uh, green. Yeah, basically in the term of um, the, uh, the this uh, chart right here just shows you what the kind of raw value is of each one of these uh, of uh, parametric tests. So, um, you know, as you, you move, you know, up and down on the scale of the, the parametric value, it tells you what that, that parametric raw value is. So Jeff, one of the problems with a lot of this stuff is it comes in as single data points. So you've got one sensor that's producing one piece of data how do you put all the stuff together and what, what, how do you make sense out of all of it from there? You know, what I'm showing here, these techniques are, you know, what can be considered univariate. So it's basically trying to uh, screen the outliers on a univariate sense, meaning that it's on a parameter, uh, a single input parameter uh, by input parameter basis. Now, uh, there's more advanced ways you can do that that uh, I'm not showing here in, in, this, uh, in this graph that you can essentially look at this from a multivariate sense that gives you, in, in a lot of cases, uh, a lot more lift out of your, uh, to your ability uh, to screen these, uh, these uh, failed parts. So basically, by looking at data in a multivariate sense, instead of just uh, saying, okay, I have one input and screen on based on that one input, what if I look at 10 or 20 uh, inputs together and given the combined uh, signal out of that, those 10 or 20 inputs, uh, what it, uh, how well am I able to build an anomaly score and uh, be able to flag uh, a potential uh, failed die better? So uh, we do have those techniques. Uh, we have uh, several of those techniques that have shown to give significant lift to that um, situation. How do you deploy this in a manufacturing setting? How does this get integrated? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. So uh, once you have trained a model and you have a model that you think can, can add value to your specific use case, what you want to do is deploy that in your production flow. And uh, what we've done, you know, there's been, uh, you know, a lot of talk and excitement about uh, edge analytics, you know, uh, pred predictions and, and inference at the edge. And uh, so uh, what we've done is, is um, we've uh, uh, developed a, uh, an inference engine that can be deployed at the OSATs, you know, where the tests are actually taking place. So here, here's uh, just a quick example of uh, a dashboard that you can look at to track your uh, predictions as they occur at the edge. And uh, what I'm showing here, and this is, you know, just some of our load testing data that uh, we've performed and uh, different ways that you can monitor the health of your uh, inference, inferences being made um, at your <clears throat> OSAT. So what I'm showing here in the upper left, or the, the top here is uh, the data frame loading time, and there's gonna be a distribution as you run uh, concurrent jobs in parallel, how, how quickly is your data load, loading for each individual um, inference that's occurring? Uh, you know, how long does it take uh, the actual model to run? And this is all in, this is in seconds. So, you know, on the order of, uh, you know, tens to hundreds of milliseconds. Um, and, you know, total over time, you know, the inference engine start to finish. Uh, how long does it take, you know, for, for a given uh, wafer? And, um, you know, there, there's other ways you can look at this. And yeah, by the way, this is on, you know, a wafer by wafer basis. And your wafer, you know, in this load testing scenario could have, uh, um, I think it's on the order of uh, 1,500 rows. That would, so that would be 1,500 individual chips. And you can look at uh, different, uh, we have the capability to look at different metrics for this. You know, for example, if you want to look at all the details for each individual uh, wafer, you could do that. You know, the, these are uh, the number of, uh, you know, for, you know, roughly 1,500 chips. How long does it take for each uh, one of these uh, segments of the inference engine to run? So this gives our users the ability to track the health of the system over time to make sure they're not missing any data, uh, making sure the, the inferences are occurring in a timely manner. And this is actually important, you know, for production to make sure that, you um, you know, the, that uh, they're able to meet their time spec for the inference and that there's no problems with data loss or anything like that. So really what you're doing here is you're able to take what is a very high level view as well as come way down on the, the data to find out, okay, if we have a problem here, let's really drill down into it, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's so, so, you know, you can think about from one end, end of the spectrum is the machine learning perspective, and that's how well the, the analytics perform. That's important, but it's also important that you can actually deploy this into production in a robust way, and you need to be able to monitor the health of that over time. So that's, I mean, that, that's very important too. So our customers want to make sure that, hey, you know, you have a good machine learning model from an analytics perspective. Uh, you're able to identify uh, failures, um, you know, effectively. But now you have to deploy that and you have to get use out of it. You got to make sure that thing runs like a hose once it's in production. So, you know, the, the, so we, we tackle that from both, uh, from both angles. The inference engine, uh, you know, really focuses on the production worthiness of deploying uh, individual models that you've trained, uh, you know, for uh, inference that you deploy in your production flow. Jeff David, thanks for a great explanation. Uh, you're welcome. My pleasure.